Hello, everyone, and welcome to CIG TV 20. With me in the studio this morning are some folks from the Department of Environment and some visitors who are here. Let me introduce them. I'll get started with the director of the Department of, of Environment here in the Cayman Islands, uh, Gina Ebanks Petrie. Mrs. Ebanks, thank you. Ebanks Petrie, thank you so much for being here with us. As well as we have uh, next to her, Dr. John Turner. Now, he is a Darwin Initiative project partner as well as uh, the senior lecturer, a senior lecturer at the Bangor University. And next to him in the orange shirt, we have Mr. James Burns. He's also a Darwin Initiative project partner as well as a uh, marine science program manager at the Nature Conserv Conservancy. Um, thank you so much for being here with us this morning. Thank Very you. important subject to talk about here are marine parks and all the revamping that wants to happen. Um, so there was a public um, call for uh, to talk about the proposals for the new marine parks, Gina. And could you remind us about some of the threats that exists with Cayman's marine parks and why it's important to make those changes at this time? Right, so everybody I'm sure is aware that we've had marine parks in Cayman for 25 years mm -hmm. now, actually 26. And um, the Department of Environment and our partners, um, Bangor University and the Nature Conservancy, embarked in a three-year project, which we're just wrapping up now, wow. um, to really take a comprehensive look at the parks and how, they, yeah. uh, how they've worked for us mm -hmm. and what uh, we need to do to make sure that the parks of the future work for us in a similar way as our, our current parks have worked. Mm -hmm. um, so that brings us to, to talk about what's different in right. Cayman. Um, since 1986. Why do we need to, to look at the parks? Lots of people say, well, you know, we have marine parks. Why do we need to change them? Mm -hmm. And uh, we need to change them because Cayman has changed. The threats that our marine environment is facing um, have changed. Right. Uh, Cayman's changed because since 1986, our local population has doubled. Mm -hmm. um, our visitor population has quadrupled. And so the numbers of people accessing our marine resources have um, increased over time, that time, and it just means that use impacts, just, you, you know, people using the marine environment, recreating in the marine environment, uh, cause a certain amount of, of stress and impact. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that we've, we've discovered in the work that we've done over the last three years um, from a science-based perspective is that actually um, the extraction of reef fish from the marine environment is a problem that we really now need to address. Okay. It's, um, it's one of the things that sort of bubbled to the surface as we've worked through the issues mm -hmm. um, from, from a science perspective. Um, so that's, that's an important threat that we didn't have right. in our radar uh, 26 years ago. We were more concerned about populations of conch and lobster diminishing back then. So we put in place replenishment zones for those two species. Mm -hmm. And I think everybody agrees that Certainly those zones have worked to stem the decline in those um, populations of, of conch and our po populations of conch and lobster, mm -hmm. um, if not to even increase them in some areas. Right. Um, so now we need to take a, a really hard look at our reef fish populations because we're seeing um, that that is, is a, represents quite a large threat to the continued health of our reefs. Mm -hmm. Then we have coastal development, which continues to expand <coughs> and grow. A lot of our population now lives, you know, very close to the, the coast and lots of activity going on in the coast. Um, we also have issues that we never even contemplated <laughs> back mm. in 1986, um, like climate change. Right. Um, coral bleaching, we're seeing that happening, you know, regularly. Um, and the, the good news is that if our reefs are healthy, mm -hmm. they appear to be able to withstand uh, the impacts of uh, these these uh, threats like climate change much better than if they're th if they're unhealthy reefs, mm -hmm. um, and the same is true of the other um, threat that we now have to deal with, which is the of course the invasive lionfish. Mm -hmm. That was definitely <laughs> not <laughs> on the radar right. in 1986, and um, and so you know these things we we really need to take a look at our parks to see are the the parks of 25 years ago properly configured, are they large enough? Mm -hmm. um, do they protect enough of our, our coastal shelf right. to ensure that we can 
really adequately address the, the current threats that we're facing. So what happens if, you know, you go through this process and those improvements are not made now to the marine parks? Well, what, what do you believe could happen? Well, I mean, I think that it is really critical that, that we accept that in the same way that 26 years ago there was, I think, quite a lot of um, opposition initially to mm -hmm. setting the areas aside, to putting the rules in place to protect our conch and lobster and putting the marine parks in place back then. Mm -hmm. um, and in the same way, I think that people are able to see the benefits of having done that 25 years ago. We just have to remember that, that things are very different today and that we have very different threats. And if we don't take action mm -hmm. today, if we don't change how we're approaching our the management of our marine resources and update and revamp and enhance our system of marine parks that you know things are not going to look any better for us that's for sure right. and we we really stand a very good chance of losing a lot of ground in terms of our marine protection that's been sort of lauded around the world and which mm -hmm. we've seen the benefit of here right and i think that's something that in a way makes it easier for us to have this conversation with the public because mm -hmm. we have seen the benefits of marine protection um, in the past and I think the the important thing now is for people to understand that you know things really have changed here and we have got to change our management tools to suit along with it yes um, dr. Turner let's uh, talk a little bit about the the continuous decline in our ecosystem do you want to uh, talk a little bit about what's happening there and let our viewers know yes certainly <coughs> I think it's important to realize that Cayman is one small part of the Caribbean, yeah. and the Caribbean overall is suffering major declines. Um, if we go back to the, the mid-70s, for instance, a lot of the Caribbean was pretty healthy mm -hmm. around that time. Um, but between then and now, we've seen major declines in coral, major declines in fish populations. Mm -hmm. Now, the reasons for this are of a very widespread, but essentially, there's a lot of impact from man. There's right. a lot of runoff from mainland. Um, this is agricultural, it's urban runoff, mm -hmm. it's sewage, it's, it's pollution from industry, which of course is going into the Caribbean Sea. Right. <coughs> At the same time, there's a lot of extraction of fish for food mm -hmm. throughout the Caribbean region. Right. Now, if we put some numbers on that, um, the cover of of corals, the living material that, that forms the, the high, highly productive base of, uh, of the, the system, um, has dropped from well above 70, 80 percent down to single figures now. It's wow. become that extreme between the 70s and now. Now this is because of the responses of the reefs to this pollution, mm -hmm. It's due to disease outbreaks, all, to all sorts of quite complicated issues. Right. Similarly with, with, with fish. Um, many fish have been removed throughout the Caribbean. Um, again, the numbers vary from different countries, mm -hmm. but we're down to perhaps less than 40, and in many places less than 20% of what was there in the 70s and 80s. Wow. So the Caribbean as a whole is, is declining, it's under threat. Now, Cayman perhaps in some ways fares a little better. Okay. Um, it's small islands, um, there aren't major rivers, there isn't a huge amount of urban runoff, pollution, mm -hmm. agriculture. Um, so in many ways, th th there are these clear blue waters around Cayman, but of course, those waters are not extremely productive overall. And what we have to remember for a place like Cayman is that although it looks as though there's a very big sea out there, there is actually a very narrow shelf on which most of the life um, exists where, 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 where people depend on it, essentially mm -hmm. where the tourism um, depends on it, where people want to go and dive, want to see marine life, where that marine life actually contributes to um, protecting the coastlines, mm -hmm. for instance, where most people actually go and fish is all this very narrow band around the islands. So although it looks a big ocean, we've actually got to protect 
the area very close to these islands. So when you speak <coughs> of protection, <coughs> what happens if we don't if protect the marine life? How, I mean, you know, and how will protecting it more actually help? Yes, if we do not put in some protection, these declines are probably going to continue. Right. I, I think we all realize that. If, for instance, um, we keep overfishing, then the result is, is that um, you're going to change the actual life around the islands because mm. the fish are living in harmony with the other organisms on the reef. Right. If, for instance, you take out many of the fish that eat algae, then algae will grow on the coral reefs. Now, for many people, they may just think it's, it's just some, some material that forms a hard bottom mm -hmm. around the island. But of course, corals themselves are highly productive. They're producing habitat for fish. Right. When that coral dies, <coughs> you end up with um, a structure that is no longer living. It can't repair itself. Mm. It doesn't build habitat for fish. Right. It doesn't create a structure that protects the coast. <coughs> Now, if the fish go, the algae starts to grow faster than the coral, and you end up with what's equivalent to, to, to a bit of a polluted desert in some ways. Wow. It, it's not very productive. Mm -hmm. So that is likely to happen. What, what you would end up with is a sort of slimy green environment, mm -hmm. which tourists don't want to come and see. Nobody wants to really go and dive in that sort of environment. Right. So that's not going to support future tourism. Mm -hmm. um, similarly, it's not going to support more fish because the habitat isn't there. It'll support some fish, but many will move away. And so the fishing will actually further collapse. Now, when you speak of the Cayman Islands, <coughs> there are three Cayman Islands. Uh, and this is a bit off, but um, are the dynamics any different for the sister islands and what's around the sister islands as opposed to Grand Cayman? Because Grand Cayman obviously is a lot more developed and, and continues to be more quickly developed. Or will it work the same for all three islands, you think, Gina? Well, I mean, we, we definitely see the similar declines, uh, okay. as John's speaking about, um, around the sister islands as well. Wow, okay. um, so, yes, I mean, we've taken a look at the three islands um, we've done, the, the studies have been done on the three islands, right. um, and we have sought public input on the three islands. Mm -hmm. So what we want to do is to make sure that, that we address each island, you know, individually. We're taking, you know, the individual characteristics of the island right. into account. Um, but certainly we need to take action on the three islands. Okay. Um, now, Mr. Byrne, let's talk a little bit about the, um, the principles of of marine parks and, and Cayman's ecosystem, because mm -hmm. we are talking about the Cayman Islands. Um, for our viewers out there who, you know, may just be going, well, what are they talking about? Can you explain that a little bit more for us? Sure. Uh, one of the things when you look at the coral reef ecosystem, and when we talk about that, it's everything from the mangroves to the seagrass beds to the coral reefs, and it all functions together. Mm -hmm. And the, the mangroves are really important habitat for juvenile fish. Okay. A, lot of, a lot of the fish you see out on the reef, they spend their juvenile time in the mangroves. Okay. And then they move out to seagrass beds, and then when they're adults, they move back out onto the reef. Okay. So all these systems are connected. Mm -hmm. And without one, you could really lose the whole system. Okay. And it's looking at it from that perspective. We have to look at it as the island as a whole, mm -hmm. and the, really the three islands together. And how do they work together? Because a lot of times we'll see fish that live on Grand Cayman when they're adults. They may go over to Little Cayman to breed for okay. spawning like groupers. We see the spawning aggregations that bring in fish from all the islands over to Little Cayman. So all the islands are interconnected. Right. That connectivity is one of the things that we really have to look at when we're trying to figure out how can we best protect these resources and make sure that they're going to exist into the future. Mm -hmm. There are some principles that exist that we've learned over the last 26 years. Um, when the system here was first set up, it had a certain purpose that was established for, and a lot of science, we've really learned a lot since then. And now we're able to take 
a lot of the experience we've seen and results we've seen happen and come up with some basic guiding principles of how to actually protect a reef system and what's the best way to do it. Okay. One of the re if you look at Cayman Islands in that context of the Caribbean, they are in a better shape than a lot of the other Caribbean islands are. A lot of the other islands have seen much more dramatic declines and a lot of that can be attributed to the hard work of Department of Environment right. over the last 26 years. Okay. But we are still seeing declines here. And when we look at how can we help, what can we do, that's always the big question. Mm -hmm. You see these big declines and everyone gets depressed and they're like, oh, they start throwing their hands up, but there are actions that we can take. Okay. One of those is enhancing the existing marine park system. Right. Taking some of the new principles that we've learned, that connectivity between different habitats, but also looking at it, do we have representation of all the different habitats across the islands? Mm -hmm. Because one of the things that happens a lot of times when you first set up an MPA, the first thing you want to do is set up the best place. This is where we got to protect it is that one. And that's great. And that's really important. But if something disastrous were to happen on that site, you could actually throw the whole system off because you don't have any other places protected. Okay. So the idea is to represent different areas across the islands mm -hmm. so that if something were drastically to happen, you would actually have another place that can help reseed those other areas. And in the same context, that's kind of what we look at when you set aside an area and say, we're going to protect this and reduce the local impacts from it and allow it to continue. It can actually have what we call a spillover effect where you see recruitment coming out from those areas and spilling out into the surrounding reefs. So you still see a benefit across the whole system by protecting different pockets of it. Okay, that's very, very interesting. I didn't know that. <laughs> um, so Gina, let's discuss the new system of marine parks and how it will actually ease the current um, enforcement uh, issues that, we, that we're encountering. Right. So um, James was mentioning uh, that, you know, we need to sort of establish these um, protected areas, these reserve areas around the islands. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, when we've gone out to the public um, and shown them the sort of new proposals, a lot of people I think are quite um, shocked that the, the actual maps don't look all that different than the current marine parks. Okay. And there's a reason for that. We've tried to, to um, build on and enhance the current system of marine parks. Okay. So. Um, where those areas have been under protection for 26 years, mm -hmm. you know, we've tried to respect that as much as possible. Right. The difference is, and this goes back to some of the, the learning that's gone on in the last 26 years, not just here in Cayman, but around the world mm -hmm. as people have put marine protected areas in place. Um, the difference is that we have, uh, we, we now recognize, uh, scientists recognize that actually you need quite a large percentage of your coastal area and as John mentioned earlier, mm. Cayman has this very narrow coastal shelf. It's one of the reasons that we're world famous for diving because right. we do have this sort of wonderful drop off very close to shore, very accessible. But it also means we have a very small area where everything happens in terms of our marine productivity but also the use of our marine resources. Okay. And so we've tried to get about, uh, follow the international guidelines and we've tried to get between 30 and 50 percent of our coastal shelf under protection. And that's what these new um, marine parks do. Okay. So people have obviously said, well, gosh, you know, how are you going to enforce that? Well, A, because they don't, the, the areas aren't all that different. The rules have changed. Okay. And the fact that the rules have changed actually makes it quite a bit easier. There are no take. So if someone is in there trying to take something, then obviously they're breaking the rules. Right. We don't okay. have to worry, what are they taking? Do they have a license for that How particular gun? <laughs> How many are they taking? Exa exactly. Okay. So there's that. But there's also the point that um, many people, I think, don't appreciate that, yes, we patrol the marine parks, but there are many rules in our marine conservation law that apply everywhere in Cayman mm -hmm. waters. Um, so we have to basically enforce the entire coastline now because there are rules everywhere right. and we have to, to enforce all the marine conservation rules. Mm -hmm. So we'll continue to enforce the marine conservation rules across the, the islands. Now that doesn't mean that we're not challenged when it comes to enforcement. Right. Um, 
we're the first people to acknowledge that we know we have seven enforcement officers to cover the three islands. We've lost some posts due to the government funding cutbacks mm -hmm. over, th over the last few years. Um, and we do, need, we do need more resources in that area. Okay. Um, but hopefully, if people uh, can understand the value and the need for these marine parks, and I think many people on the islands do, mm -hmm. they will help us by, first of all, respecting the rules, and secondly, by also acting as an extension of our eyes and ears, you know, in terms of enforcement, and help us to, to call in either to the DOE or to the police. So yes, we do need more resources. We need adequate powers for our officers, which we don't currently have. Mm. That needs new legislation, which is a whole other subject. Right. Um, but, but, you know, we've been banging on about the need for the NCL, the National Conservation Law, and that's one area, too, that will be covered in the National Conservation Law is providing adequate powers for our officers. Okay. So, yes, I mean, the, the answer is that, yes, there are challenges, but those challenges exist now. And right. these marine parks, we believe, um, will not uh, really cause us to, to buckle any more than, uh, or to struggle any more than we're currently struggling. All right, well, let's talk a little bit more about that because you mentioned um, having to uh, cut back posts and, and so on and so forth, and there have been recent government um, budget concerns and, and cuts as well. So mm -hmm. how, does it, how does the DOE uh, intend to manage the more improved, bigger marine parks um, in light of all this? Well, I mean, as I said before, uh, Donna, obviously we're going to have to, if we're successful in, in promoting the, the new uh, parks, and we hope, you know, for the sake of the, the country that we are, um, that we'll need, so obviously, new signage. Um, there'll, be, there'll need to be an explanation of the new rules, etc. Right. Um, but we've been very careful. We've tried to carefully sort of manage the money that we've spent on, on the existing signage and, and so forth right. in anticipation of having to change some of it. Um, so I think in terms of, of that sort of aspect of it, there will be costs incurred. But in terms of the, the additional enforcement, um, I don't see immediately um, you know, any immediate increase um, other than if, if somehow we were to be lucky enough to land a couple of more en enforcement officers, that would be wonderful. Right. Um, but we need those now. If, mm -hmm. if we don't get the parks, we need those. Right. So it, it's, not, it's not as if these parks are going to put an extra, you know, huge burden on us in terms of enforcement. Okay, let's talk a little bit about the logistics and um, the financial benefits of having the marine parks. Well, I mean, uh, John and James, I think, both touched on the, the really important role that Cayman's marine environment plays um, from a tourism perspective. And I think everybody appreciates and understands that in Cayman. Big impact. You know, a huge impact. And, and then some of the things that we don't talk about, um, probably enough, but we've heard actually quite a lot of as we've gone around to the public, mm -hmm. On, and consulted on the marine parks is this whole um, connection between our marine environment and the health of our marine environment and our marine resources okay. and people's sort of sense of identity, the whole cultural, the heritage aspect of it, and the identity, uh, you know, Cayman in identity sort of all wrapped up in this um, connection with the marine environment and, and the resources in there. Yeah, it's been a big part of people's livelihoods. It has yeah. been, and, and it's also been a, a big part of everybody's life. It's, you know, and I think that even um, people that we've welcomed and who've become Caymanians, I think they very much relate mm -hmm. um, to the marine environment. It's part of what drew them here, right. um, and it's certainly you know, whether it's sailing or it's diving or it's boating on the weekend or whatever, or just, or just the view, or just be able to swim in, in very clear, unpolluted waters. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think that, that sort of identity issue is all tied up in the health of our marine environment. Right. And, uh, and I think that's hard to place a value on. It's it easier is. to recognize the immediate sort of dollar value right. of the... Of the uh, the tourism aspect. And then there are people who, you know, people in our community who also subsist, you know, on, on our, from fishing, yeah, fishing and, and yeah. from our marine environment. So right. 
And that's one of the things I think that we've also tried to explain as we've gone, gone to the public is that these parks are not just about the tourism aspect. They are truly, we're trying to make these parks for all the people of the Cayman Islands. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whether we're talking about the role that our reefs play in coastal protection when we have a storm, our reefs, healthy reefs are one of the first line of defenses for, for storms and hurricanes. Right. Um, healthy reefs actually mean that the sand that we produce for our beaches is, is around, so that's really important. Mm -hmm. um, but also, I mean, we've, we've tried to say to people, look, as James was explaining, when you protect pockets, when you set aside pockets mm -hmm. and you have them as no-take areas, yes, it means you can't access those areas and take in those areas, but the benefits of protecting these, these uh, areas is that you actually get the spillover effect, as John mentioned earlier, um, into the areas where people can go and fish. Okay. So the idea is that by, by setting aside areas, we actually enhance the possibility that people who rely on catching the occasional fish for dinner mm -hmm. can actually continue to do that in the long term because those protected areas sort of serve as a bank and and replenish right. the areas um, that are are open so for exploitation. Yeah. Exactly. And I think that, you know, that's an important point that we've been trying to make as we, we go around because I think a lot of people okay. see these parks as taking more from them. And we've been trying to say, look, you need to flip the way you're thinking about this. Yeah. And you need to really understand that what we're trying to do here is actually preserve your ability to continue to take fish, conch, lobster, whatever, from the marine environment. Right. Yes, it will also mean that we protect our coral reefs and hopefully um, protect the diving industry mm -hmm. and the water sports industries as well. Right. But it is also about just protecting the resources for people. It, it is okay. hard for people to actually appreciate how vulnerable these marine systems are. Yeah. Because they've, they've always been there and they've always been providing for people. Right. And I think a lot of people are probably rather unaware of how quickly these marine ecosystems can be lost. Right. We had a big bleaching event where lots of the corals bleached and subsequently died. Mm -hmm. Um, in 1998. Scientists predict that there are going to be many more of those in the years to come as the oceans warm. Now this really means it's absolutely critical for Cayman to reduce many of the other impacts. Mm -hmm. So the reef is as healthy as possible so that hopefully it can respond right. to these sorts of incidents. So. I think sometimes people are unaware how critical it is that this protection is put in place. It, it may mean that there, that there may be a little bit of restriction now to ensure that there's a lot more freedom later on. Right. So it's an investment at this right. point in time. Well, I'm sure that Gina can appreciate. I mean, having talking, speak, spoken to a lot of locals, a lot of fishermen who do fish mm -hmm. for conch lobster and fish, um, they, they, they've been taught from the time they were young boys, most of them, to fish. And that's how they get their money. That's how they make their, their, their living. Um, but at the same time, they don't seem to realize and understand that with development, comes less and you have to protect it more and that's exactly. really that's really the issue here so educating the public is is part of the whole process and hopefully this exactly. show will help yes. um, help in that in that process so um, you've carefully designed um, initial proposals and you've taken them to the public for, for the feedback so what happens now and then what happens going forward from there Gina okay well certainly right now this week with John and James on island um, we've been uh, taking careful account of the public feedback that we've had thus okay. far and uh, trying to see where there's potential to make tweaks to the the system that we've proposed mm -hmm. um, to take account of people's feedback um, and once we have arrived at a final version of the proposals that okay. meet our goals that address uh, as John and James have been talking you know the the scientific principles that we now know we must embody in these new proposals. Mm -hmm. um, once, they're, once they're ready, we're then going to make 
those proposals available to our ministry and that they will then, uh, the minister will then hopefully take them to cabinet. Okay. And once cabinet makes uh, a decision, we, we are then able to have new marine parks because uh, the marine parks can be actually amended by regulation. They okay. don't have to go to the entire legislative assembly. Um, one of the encouraging things that we've, we've had in the sort of public consultation mm -hmm. um, period is that we've actually been working very closely with um, one of the communities in particular in East End. Okay. Um, the community liaison officer there, Delmira Bodden, has really stepped up and she's really um, organized the community in terms of we've met, we've uh, sort of had a subgroup of their their community come and meet with us and talk through some of the issues that they have with the current proposals, okay. um, make counter proposals to us, um, and you know we, we continue that dialogue. Right. And we're also hoping to meet actually today with the MLA from Northside, who's okay. also bringing his um, community's input to us to discuss. Uh, so we're really encouraged by that. And we've also had, you know, obviously individual feedback as we've gone around the, the district and had meetings. Right. Um, people have come into the DOE and looked at the displays, et cetera, and have also provided us with feedback. And it's been very encouraging, you know, uh, over sort of two-thirds of the, um, the respondents, individual <coughs> respondents, have been supportive. Um, and that includes uh, quite a lot of, of uh, controversial feedback from meetings in West Bay and Cayman Brack in particular. Okay. So um, we're very encouraged so far by the public feedback. Oh, it's unusual to hear about the dynamics of each, uh, each community and how yes. they respond to these things. Yeah. So as we wrap up, any final words from you, Mr. Byrne, on uh, the importance of, of moving forward and having the new and improved marine parks put in place mm -hmm. uh, as soon as possible? Yeah, I think one of the, the really key important things was touched on. Um, by Gina and by your questions there, we can design systems really well and provide all the best scientific information in, into it, but it really comes down to the people of Cayman embracing it and really how they can accept it and move forward with it because mm -hmm. that's where you get success. And that understanding that the reason behind this is if we don't have actions, we all will, will lose across the Caribbean and Cayman in particular would lose without that action because this, the reefs are on decline around the globe and we have to take these local actions to really stem that and reduce that decline and get the reefs to be able to sustain into the future. Mm -hmm. And it's not just about protecting individual sites, it really is about protecting the system and the way of life that people of Cayman have enjoyed. All right, Dr. Turner, any final words? Yes, I, I think um, it's very important for people to realize that you do have to protect quite a lot mm -hmm. so that those areas where you're protecting can feed the other areas and that means they've got to be somewhere mm -hmm. <laughs> and um, the communities really have to see these as a, an advantage not a disadvantage right. um, overall this is going to make the marine areas much better right. around their communities and they're going to benefit more from these areas in longer term so it does require perhaps a change in thinking. It, it, it means that people have got to think about the future. What will their children want to see around Cayman? Mm -hmm. um, that really is important. And so, you know, we're asking people really to to think just beyond themselves. Think think what's required for the future. Right, uh, Mrs. <coughs> Banks Petrie. Now I know that your department has, you know taken the bull by its horn and you're moving forward um, with this and want it to happen obviously um, and hopefully the next stage will allow you to, to do that but you know I just want to point out to people out there who who are watching to tell their friends and family that you know to get involved in what's going on as far as the marine parks and, and the improvements that are suggested to, to be made um, and, and actually uh, support that because it's important for your department, it's important for the country in a whole. But just to wrap up, any final words from you, what you would say to the public out there who may be listening? Yes, I mean, one of the things that I would say is that this ultimately is not about the DOE. Right. <laughs> right. This is about the Cayman Islands um, as a whole because as I said quite a few times when we were out in the public uh, consultation, the DOE can continue to document the decline of our marine right. resources. Right. Um, I would not wish to, to have to do that. 
um, because I live here too and I have a child and I would like to, to ensure that um, you know, his future is protected as well. Mm -hmm. And that's what this is about. It's about investing in our future. Okay. And I really think that, that if I had to sort of leave a final message, it's that, that uh, you know, this isn't about the DOE or any particular government even. Mm -hmm. This is about our collective future. Right. And that we really need to shift our thinking from the idea that, that these protected areas um, are taking something away from us. Mm -hmm. And we need to look at them more as an investment, an investment in our future. All right, Mr. Byrne, Dr. Turner, this is Ebanks Petrie. Thank you so much for being here with us on CIG TV 20. And of course, to our viewers out there, we hope that you've been enlightened and you now know more about our, Marines, uh, our marine, marine parks and our ecosystem here in the Cayman Islands. And of course, we invite you to stay tuned to CIG TV 20 in the coming months so that we can bring you more details on exactly how the process is going forward and what the final results are. Thank you, as always, for joining us.